So the other day I was thinking about clustering some high-dimensional data, and for that I needed the volume of a unit n-sphere. And uh, I could look up the formula on Wikipedia, but I was also curious about how to derive it. And the Wikipedia article actually proved very unhelpful in that regard. I remember there was an easy trick to do that, because I learned it in graduate statistical mechanics. And so I dug up the old notes, and I want to share this trick with you. So actually, this is the exact same trick that you might use to find the area under a Gaussian, which is the curve y equals minus x squared, also known as the bell curve, uh, which we draw here. So to find the area under the Gaussian, we need to take this integral. We need to integrate e to the minus x squared dx from minus infinity to plus infinity. What is this integral? Well, it's not very easy to figure out what this integral is. But what we can do is take this original expression, the integral, and square it, and figure out the value of what that is. And it turns out to be much easier to do than the original one. So how does that work? Well, we take the square of the integral, which means we take this integral expression and multiply it by itself. And then what we can do is we can simply rewrite this expression by moving all the integral signs to the left and all the dx's to the right. And we also write e to the minus x1 squared times e to the minus x2 squared is e to the minus the quantity x1 squared plus x2 squared. Notice that we also renamed x's to x1 and x2 in the two separate integrals to keep uh, from getting confused. And it turns out that whereas the original integral was pretty hard to work out, this double integral, even though it looks harder, it's actually much easier. And the reason it is easy is that we can rewrite it in polar coordinates. And to switch to polar coordinates, we simply rewrite x1 squared plus x2 squared as r squared. This is, this is essentially the Pythagorean theorem. And then we rewrite the dx1, dx2 area element as r dr d theta. And so when we do these substitutions, uh, what we end up is a, a double is a double integral in polar coordinates, uh, where r goes from 0 to infinity and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi of e to the minus r squared r dr d theta. We can work that out using u substitution. So you separate the d theta integral from the du integral, and the d theta integral just gives you 2 pi, but you also have a 1 half out front that you got uh, in the process of the u substitution, so the answer is pi, which is a very common answer and a very tasty answer. And so now we know the answer to the original question. We know that the value of the integral squared of the Gaussian is pi, so that means that the uh, non-squared integral of the Gaussian is the square root of pi. Easy, right? So what does any of this have to do with the volume of an n-dimensional sphere? Well, the trick that I just showed you involved going to two dimensions to work out this expression, but you could also go to three dimensions, or four dimensions, or n dimensions. And so it turns out that when you go to n dimensions, the volume of an n-dimensional sphere becomes very relevant. So before we get there, let's work out the case for three dimensions. So we just, just did something in two dimensions, and uh, we can do something extremely similar in three dimensions, uh, and then we can generalize to n. So rerunning the same exact procedure in three dimensions, what we do is we say, well, we, we say we have this one-dimensional integral that we don't really know how to solve, and so let's try to work out this expression cubed before we had it squared, and uh, this integral cubed, we just uh, write this integral down three times, change the variables uh, to be x1, x2, and x3 in uh, the first, second, and third integral, and now, instead of going to polar coordinates, we can go to spherical coordinates. And th things in spherical coordinates work uh, very similarly uh, to what they did, uh, to how they worked in polar coordinates. Now we have x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared equals r squared. And now the dx1, dx2, dx3 is the volume element, and in the spherical coordinates is r squared dr times some stuff involving thetas and phis. And uh, we uh, actually want to separate the r squared dr from the angular variables, so we'll write it as r squared dr uh, times d omega 2. And uh, we'll get to what d omega 2 is in, a little, in just a little bit. So working as before, we 
uh, rewrite this integral in terms of uh, the r part and the d omega part. And I'm not going to go through the details, but using the exact same methods as we used in polar coordinates, we get the answer that is square root of pi cubed. Which makes a lot of sense, because we already know that the correct answer is the square root of pi, so uh, the value of that expression cubed should be the square root of pi cubed. So everything is consistent. So now that we've done the case for two and three dimensions, let's do the case for n dimensions. By now it should be pretty clear how we proceed. We take this integral to the nth power, rewrite it in terms of n integrals, collect all the integral signs on the left and dx's on the right, and it's still going to be pretty easy. And instead of spherical coordinates, we now need to go to n-dimensional hyperspherical coordinates. What else? And as before, the squares of all x's give us r squared. But now we have to be slightly more careful about how we treat the volume element. So before, in three dimensions, we just said that dx1, dx2, dx3 is equal to uh, this radial part uh, times the angular part that we denoted by omega. And now remember that in the two-dimensional case, we had something very similar. We had dx1, dx2 that we wrote as r dr times the angular variable d theta, which for consistency with the three-dimensional case, let's write it as d omega 1, because there's only one angular variable. Uh, here, in three dimensions, we write d omega 2, because there are two angular variables. But now it's important to understand what these d omegas actually represent. So in the two-dimensional case, when we do the integral over uh, d omega 1, that is to say, uh, the integral over d theta, what we are really doing is we are integrating the line elements along a unit circle, like so. So once we add up all the infinitesimal line elements, what we get is simply the perimeter of this a circle, or I should say a disk. But because we are fancy mathematicians, we don't say disk, we say a two-sphere, a sphere in two dimensions. And the surface area of a two-sphere, or a disk, is just the perimeter of a circle. Now it turns out that in the three-dimensional case the integral over d omega 2 is conceptually the exact same thing except for one dimension higher. So w when we integrate over the angular variables what we're, re really, what we're really doing is we're integrating over little infinitesimal patches of a surface on the surface this time of a three-dimensional sphere, a three-sphere, also known as a sphere. And so the integral just gives us the surface area of a sphere. So now we're ready to tackle the n-dimensional case. What we do in n-dimensions is we separate the radial part from the angular part, uh, and the angular part we will call d omega n minus 1, because there are n minus 1 angular variables and one radial variable. And so once again, we rewrite our original integral in terms of the radial part and the angular part, and in two-dimensional case, the angular part gave us the surface area of a two-sphere. In three-dimensional case, the angular part gave us the surface area of a three-sphere. And in the n-dimensional case, we get the surface area of an n-sphere, which we will denote by s sub n. So s sub n is actually kind of what we're trying to determine, but the cool thing is that we don't have to explicitly compute it. Because at the end, you will see that it magically falls out as a result of the rest of our calculations. So now, let's look at the radial integral. The radial integral looks uh, very similar to what we had in two dimensions and then three dimensions. In uh, two dimensions we had e to the minus r squared times r dr. In two dimensions, w in three dimensions we had e to the minus r squared r squared dr. And here we have e to the minus r squared r to the power n minus 1 dr. And so we can mess around with it a little bit and try to put everything in terms of r squared using pretty simple algebra, and then use u substitution with r squared being equal to u, and we get this integral in terms of u. So now we actually have to cheat a little bit and look this integral up on the internet. And what we find is that this integral gives us something called the gamma function. Now the gamma function is very famous and very cool and has a very long Wikipedia page. 
and one of the things that you can find on the Wikipedia page is that the gamma function is essentially the generalization of a factorial for integral values of n. Gamma of n is equal to n minus 1 factorial. For n equals to 1 half, gamma function gives the square root of pi, and also gamma of n plus 1 is equal to n times gamma n. And of course, you can use the gamma function uh, to play hangman. Now, because gamma function is kind of like a factorial, it grows very rapidly with increasing n, which uh, you can see on the plot here. And uh, this is something to keep in mind for later. So, okay, cool. We just worked out the radial integral, and guess what? We pretty much know the answer, right? Because we said that the angular part of the integral is something we called S sub n, the surface area of an n-sphere, and the radial part of the integral is the uh, expression involving the gamma function. And remember that our original uh, expression was taking the Gaussian integral and taking it to the power of n, but we already know the answer to that. That's going to be the square root of pi to the power of n. So now we can use this and solve for s sub n. So s sub n, the surface area of the n-sphere, is given by this. So now that we know the area of the unit n-sphere, we can easily compute the volume of the unit n-sphere. And to compute the volume of a sphere, we just need to write down its surface area as a function of the radius and integrate it with respect to r. And it works for, and it works in any dimension. But as you can see, s sub n here is independent of r, so all we need to work out is the integral of r to the power n minus 1 dr, which is just r to the n divided by n. And for a unit sphere, when r is equal to 1, the answer is just s sub n divided by n. We can write it down explicitly as pi to the power n over 2 divided by n over 2 times the gamma function of n over 2, and we can use one of the properties of the gamma function to simplify it a little bit. So, we get this very simple expression, and this is the volume of a unit n-sphere. Easy peasy! Now, one of the reasons that this is kind of a cool result is that the volume of a unit n-sphere doesn't really behave like you would expect it to. You would expect that as the dimensionality of the sphere increases, the volume would probably grow, because, hey, n is larger, you can probably put more stuff inside a sphere of 20 dimensions uh, versus three dimensions, it actually turns out not to be the case. And the reason for that is that the volume, as you can see, involves the n over 2 the power of pi in the numerator, but it has the gamma function in the denominator. And the gamma function increases very rapidly as n grows, because gamma function is kind of like, is kind of like a factorial. So here's a plot where we have the volume of the unit n-sphere on the y-axis and n on the x-axis. And we see that after n equals 5, where v sub n peaks, this function actually dives down to 0 pretty quickly. So in particular, the volume of a 30-dimensional sphere is f pi to the fifth divided by a bazillion. Uh, actually, by a trillion, but it uh, doesn't really make a difference because uh, it's uh, very, very small. So in summary, Gaussians, gamma functions, and n-dimensional hyperspheres are pretty awesome. And now you know that the volume of an infinite dimensional sphere is zero. So math is pretty weird and pretty cool and pretty useful because, hey, without math, we couldn't do physics. That's all I have for today. Hope you liked it. Bye.